Hey guys, I'm Eddie, and in this video I'm going to be talking about what is critical care medicine. Basically, the way I look at it is critical care is when a patient is too sick to be out on the floor, hey, give me a call. If you don't know what to do, give me a call. I'm going to be happy to help. And a lot of my colleagues share the exact same sentiment. In this particular video, I'm going to be talking about the definition of critical care medicine as per the American College of Physicians. In addition to that, I'm going to be talking about the very integral teamwork that exists in the ICU. I can't do my job without my nurses, respiratory therapists, uh, pharmacists, um, physical and occupational therapists, my dietitians, all and case managers, all those people come together to really make an ICU team. It's not about me, it's about the whole group. I'm also going to discuss how to become an intensivist because it is a difficult journey. It's a long journey, but I think it's very well worth it and, you know, here I am. Then I'm going to conclude this video answering some questions from some of my viewers, which I've been extremely thrilled, thrilled about all the feedback and all the uh, times that I've actually helped people, which is the whole point of this channel is to help some people during their journey decide what they want to do with their lives, answer their questions, etc. I'm very grateful that I've actually passed 750 subscribers. This has been pretty <laughs> pretty interesting and uh, I, definitely, I definitely love all the support. So if you haven't subscribed to my channel and you're interested in what I do, feel free to subscribe and then you'll, you'll be in the loop. Um, one of my... Um, one of my resolutions, I'm not a big resolutions guy, but one of my resolutions is to do more videos for 2018 and hopefully uh, get the ball rolling a little bit more, so stay posted. Now what is critical care medicine? The definition of the American College of Physicians defines it as encompassing the diagnosis and treatment of human beings in their extreme physiologic conditions. It, you know, something as a simple CHF exacerbation could uh, be taken care of in the floor. Sometimes uh, people who don't have resources, primary care physicians, you know, put that on their backs and they start diuracing the patients and checking labs daily and all that from the outpatient setting. But in in the ICU, I mean, we do the craziest, coolest stuff when people are extremely, extremely sick. And one of the important things about critical care medicine, as I mentioned before, it's not about me. It's not about the intensivist. It's not about the ICU doc. It's about the team. Because I count on, I can't, I can't stress it enough, how much I count on my nurses to be right there in my ear talking to me about what their concerns are, what, what the clinical deteriorations and changes are in the patient. If there's a neurologic change, I need that. And I need to have an environment where my nurses could come and, you know, communicate these things with me uh, without concern of repercussions or me yelling at them. Um, there is a lot of education that goes on, but still, it's, it's about making the patient better. Um, one of the cool things about, about, ICU work is that we do a lot of procedures, uh, intubation, central lines, arterial lines, uh, LPs, thoracentesis, paracentesis, um, any, any of these particular particular procedures we can knock out in any, any particular day, chest tubes as well. I mean, there's other things, but I just can't, uh, I can't bring them to mind, but you have to be very competent with the, with the data you collect from it. I mean, what good is it to put a swan gas catheter in a patient if you can't uh, interpret the cardiac index or calculate an SVR or anything like that and not know what to do with the numbers? So those are, those are kind of things that you need to uh, be trained and be comfortable with as an intensivist because you will, have, you will be able to you know, reach in your pocket and have all these tools, but you need to know how to use them. One of the things that comes along with taking care of patients in the ICU is having to make a lot of difficult, difficult decisions. And this is something that burdens a lot of folks where, where they will not want to practice in an intensive care unit. But you need to have a lot of end-of-life conversations and goals of care conversations. A lot of times these are very difficult from social, from uh, religious, from many different aspects that one doesn't normally think about. But the truth is a lot of people die in the ICU. And... It's up to you to help out those families and be part of the team and bring them into the team to make decisions that are going to basically change the outcome for the patients. You know, it's also very tough that you need to be good at, at estimating prognosis for the patient and help determine quality of life. Um, these are all very, very gray areas, but they're things that, as you gain experience, I, I know I'm still young, but um, even, even myself to this day, I'm still working on getting better at all these things because it's a, it's a continuous process. And you always have to be ready to counsel patients, counsel families with regards to their, their decisions and what that entails. So getting back to the whole team approach, you need to be a team player. You can't be the expert at absolutely everything with regards to the care of these patients. You will have many interactions throughout the course of the day with many different people, from respiratory therapists who help you out with the ventilators and help um, you know, titrate ventilators and, and do things of that nature. That's their, that's their niche. You also have to work with uh, 
care coordinators, case managers who help uh, disposition your pa patients who could potentially go to an LTAC, which is a long-term acute care hospital or a, or a rehabilitation center directly from the ICU. These are things that you know you want to hand over the torch to somebody else to help you out with. Um, you also work with a lot with pharmacists because you will be using a lot of medications and um, having a good pharmacist to help dose your antibiotics, especially with such great fluctuations in renal function and things of that nature, you kind of need them there by your side. Nutrition is extremely important in the ICU, um, and your dietitians are going to be right there with you to help determine what the rate of nutrition should be, what formulation to use, excuse me, and, you know, they're part of your team. Don't forget to be nice to the people who clean your floors, clean your bathrooms, clean your call room, because without them, your job is a little bit more miserable, and they're doing their job to the best of their ability, so please be polite to them. One of the things I like about the teams in the ICU is that you have a lot of face-to-face -face time with your consultants. Um, you know, if you work in hospital medicine, you're rounding throughout a whole hospital, 20-something patients, and you might not be there when your consultant arrives. But say, for example, a nephrologist, you know, I run down the whole list with all the patients who I'm sharing with a nephrologist, and we just quickly chat about every patient and what our objectives and goals are for the patient for that day. That's something that in other specialties you don't necessarily get a good like grasp on, but my ICU, since it's closed, I track all these people down, and they track me down because they know that we like to, to exchange ideas and, and see what's going to be the best decision to make for our patient. And if you want to learn what my day would be like as an intensivist, uh, I made a video about that a couple of weeks ago, so right about now, that should show up, either on this side or this side. I don't know. So how do you get into a cool kids club? How do you become an intensivist? Well, there are a couple different ways of doing it, and the most common one that everybody hears about is to do pulmonary and critical care medicine. That's not the route that I chose, and I can make a completely different video as to why I didn't go that, down that route, but the truth about me, and this is my personal opinion, is twofold. First, I don't like clinic. I don't like, uh, I, I just, it just stresses me out to have 15 minutes allotted to each patient, and then in those 15 minutes, you know, somebody's having an emotional problem and I just want to take care of them because I think I'm a nice guy. And then, you know, time runs out and then I have to hurry or kick them out or I can spend more time with them. And then, you know, delay the care of the next patient. That just, that just drives me insane. I mean, I'd rather have some really tough end of life conversations every once in a while than to have this particular scenario where every single day, you know, clinic is just, it, it just stresses me out. If you like clinic, go do pulmonary critical care hands down to you. The other thing is that for me it will be really tough to be really good at two different specialties. So um, I'm trying to be really good at critical care. I work on it every single day. But if I had to be an expert at pulmonology as well and be the best at something, it's it would be very hard to kind of split because they're two completely different types of uh, medicine practices. But this video is about doing critical care only, so I'm going to touch up on how to become just a pure intensivist. There are a couple of different routes to do it. You could be either residency trained in internal medicine, emergency medicine, surgery, anesthesia, or neurology. So through any of those five specialties, you could get into a critical care fellowship. There are little differences and nuances about them, but I'm going to touch up on mostly uh, the internal medicine part. First, it's really hard to get a fellowship. It's really competitive. And part of the problem why uh, critical care, you don't hear about the pure critical care fellowship as much as a pulmonary critical care, is because there's over 150 uh, pulmonary critical care fellowship programs. However, pure critical care medicine, the two-year program or the one-year program, depending on something I'm gonna talk on in a moment, there are about 40 of them. I think there are less than 40 of them. It's really hard to get the actual number of programs. Um, you could check on uh, ERAS to check that out or Google it. But according to ATS, the American Thoracic Society, there are about 40 programs. If you want to do anesthesia critical care, there are only about 20 programs based on what I saw. I could be wrong on this. In surgery, there are about 14. Emergency medicine, they're usually housing in medicine critical care programs, but also like 40 different programs. If you want to do neurocritical care, also less than 20 if my, if my resources are correct. So this kind of gives you an idea why it's so hard to get into the pure critical care uh, subspecialty. 150, greater than 150 for pulmonary critical care, and less than 40 for pure critical care. There are three different pathways to be able to get into critical care medicine, and mostly I'm going to focus on the emergency medicine or internal medicine background. 
The first one is that if you're either trained in internal medicine or emergency medicine, which are three-year residency programs, then you could elect to get into one of these 40 programs that do a two-year pure critical care medicine fellowship training. And that's what I did. I did an internal medicine-based critical care medicine program. The second pathway that you could go on is if you go ahead and do internal medicine and then you do a subspecialty, whether it be cardiology, GI, uh, nephrology, ID. Once you finish that, that fellowship program, um, then you could go ahead and do a one-year critical care medicine program. And then you'd have to filter into those, you know, I think, I think you have to filter into one of those 40 programs to do that additional year. The third pathway, which was one that was unfamiliar to me, but it still wouldn't have been one that I, that I would have taken, is to go ahead and do your internal medicine training, and then you do a two-year advanced uh, medicine fellowship, which is something that I didn't even know existed, if I'm quite honest. And then after that, you do one year of pure critical care medicine. And then those are the three pathways to be able to, to, be able to get into a critical care medicine fellowship. So the way that, in my life, the way that I went through all this was, uh, I really wanted to do critical care and I had only heard probably like you had only heard of pulmonary critical care and then one day I was sitting down when, when I was in my residency and I was talking to a nephrologist who was just sitting down right next to me and I had heard that this guy was nephrology critical care but just because I talked to everybody um, and tried to make as many not necessarily connections but just try to be friendly with everybody uh, he asked me what I was going to do in my life, and I told him that I really wanted to do pulmonary critical care, but I didn't like the clinic, as I, as I mentioned to you. And so he explained to me that, especially up in the Northeast, because I was doing my training in the Southeast at the time, um, that in the Northeast, there were a number of programs that do pure critical care, like in New York and uh, New Jersey and, and things like that, places like that. And so that got kind of like the wheel spinning a little bit to get into one of these two-year programs. The other thing is that I was tired of being a trainee and I wanted to make some money already so uh, two years was definitely more appetizing than a three-year uh, pulmonary critical care fellowship. So upon doing that research I found these 40 programs or so and then I went ahead and, and started chasing all that down and eventually got into one of those places. But just know that sometimes opportunities and ideas are going to pop out from where you least expect it. I mean this was a random Wednesday that I was working until 8 o'clock finishing up some discharges and this guy just happened to sit next to me and just changed my life forever in that regard. So keep your eyes open. Now what did my training look like during my two-year fellowship? Well if you do pulmonary critical care it's a three-year program as most of you know and the way it's broken down depends on the depends on the institution but generally speaking with a bunch of research thrown in there it's about two years of pulmonary and one year of critical care. In my two-year critical care, pure critical care training program, I got trained in cardiac ICU, cardiothoracic ICU, medical, surgical, uh, trauma, neuro ICU, and in addition to that, I got a lot of ECMO and, and advanced heart failure experience. So every institution is a little bit different, but that's what my particular training program gave me. You know, I didn't have to go and do any clinics, which was awesome, and then uh, I got a lot of electives and things like that where I, get to, where I get to do awesome cool stuff and just learn some extra tricks and skills. So... That's what my training looked like. It was two years, it went by really quick, and uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. I was very happy with my training. In case you want to learn more about critical care, there are a couple of different societies, two of which I'm a member of, which is uh, CHEST and the Society of Critical Care Medicine. But you, in addition to that, you can look into the American Thoracic Society and uh, get some information with regards to critical care and find out if it's the correct career for you. Something a lot of people ask me about is the job market, because Basically, critical care traditionally, as I mentioned, is pulmonary critical care. And now we're the new kids on the block, being the pure critical care guys. I got a lot of job offers, and I'm very fortunate to be able to say that. And the reason why I feel like I got so many job offers was because most of these traditionally pulmonary critical care groups are noticing that the acuity is getting far worse, uh, is getting higher with regards to the, the critically ill patients. And in my opinion, it's very difficult to be able to do both critical care and pulmonary, which is, as I mentioned, one of the reasons why I didn't want to do that. Um, but a lot of these shops where I had interviews and I talked to the guys on the phone, um, and girls, by the way, they basically said they needed help in the ICU. They needed people to help pick up shifts, both day shifts, night shifts, and they just needed help. And they were willing to work their current models around in order to fit me and fit others. There were certain institutions where I interviewed that they were looking for four of me. And if you look at those 40 programs that they each only pump out about two to three fellows each year, you know, we're talking about maximum 120 um, peer critical care doctors and there's a far greater need for this. This is the reason why I'm doing these videos. I mean, I have job security forever, but I want you guys to be able to help me and help the country um, basically 
take care of all these patients who are going to get really sick within the next couple decades and yeah we need help one thing i get asked about my schedule is what is it like well you know given that i'm a pure icu guy i work kind of like a hospitalist where i do a seven off seven off type of type of deal but one thing you need to be aware of is that you will work night shifts that's just part of the part of the deal if you're working at a center where the acuity is extremely high and in addition to that you're busy um, you could definitely count on working night shifts. Now, you could go ahead and sign with a, with a smaller hospital, I guess sub 300, and have the hospitalist take call for you overnight and things like that, but that's all about, all about what you want. The particular hospital where I'm working at now has uh, between 500 and 600 beds, and we need somebody in-house 24-7 because people are sick and people refer to us. So it's always nice to have, a, to have an intensivist there to be able to assess the patient and take care of problems. Now, there are resources to help you throughout all of this, and you can definitely check out the ABIM, the American Board of Internal Medicine, and the American Board of Emergency Medicine, where they have come together to, you know, do all the testing and the certification for everybody who comes out of these training programs. You should also check out ERAS and just Google these programs. That's going to be the easiest way to find that information that, you know, you might need. Or you could just email me or uh, send me a message here on YouTube. But all in all, that's what it is to be a critical care medicine doctor and this is what critical care medicine actually is with regards to the training how to get into it and what the teamwork is like so hope you enjoyed the video uh, thank you very much for watching and subscribe give me a thumbs up like the video if you do like it if, if i gave you any type of um if i gave you any type of uh insight or if i helped you out in any way shape or form i would appreciate a thumbs up thanks very much for watching see you later